Good afternoon. Welcome. Aloha. And in so many different languages, welcome to all of you who are gathered today. We are honored and delighted to have two fantastic uh, esteemed colleagues join us from Hawaii and also from uh, the East Coast, from Boston. Uh, Thomas West is, is joining us from the East Coast. Dr. Maya Sotero Ng is joining us from Hawaii. I will share their bios. We also have the honor uh, of joining uh, today with two of our STAR students and uh, Portia Johnson and Siobhan um, will also be part of our discussion. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's Mays Institute lecture and um, also just share very briefly the bios of our honored panelists and speakers today. I want to also say that uh, it has been personally a joy to get to know these panelists and spend some time virtually with them and um, learn about their work importantly, uh, the work around peace, around justice and raising up young leaders is so needed in today's environment. So really welcome to both of you and thanks for your time. I'll share their bios. We will launch right into our questions for today but I'd like to invite our audience, wherever you're located, to send in your questions. We have a um, special portion of the program where we'll engage all of you in our Q&A period, but please start sending in your questions as they come to you, and we will leave lots of time at the end to engage with all of you and build as much community as we can, even though we're not able to be gathered physically. So let me start with the bios and then quickly go into today's program. So I'll start with, with uh, Dr. Maya Sotero Ng. Uh, some of you already have seen her bio, so it's quite uh, impressive all the work that she's done. Um, I'll just mention a few quick highlights. The more detailed bio is in your program. She's the co-founder of the Peace Studio. She's also a consultant on the international team of the Obama Foundation and a faculty specialist at the University of Hawaii. Uh, prior to these roles, she directed the Matsunaga Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii, where she led outreach and development initiatives and also taught some courses on leadership for social change, peace movements, peace education, and conflict management. Dr. Maya, I'd love to take some of those classes. I hope they're still open for those of us who wanna learn more about these topics. They're so needed in today's world. In addition, she's also worked as a history teacher um, and has uh, taught at many different levels at the graduate as well as undergraduate levels. In her role as a nonprofit leader, she sits on many boards and she's the co-founder of several nonprofits, including the Peace Studio, but also the Institute for Climate and Peace. One aspect of her bio that also uh, came to my attention recently is her work standing up a new scholarship in her mother's honor in uh, the Seattle area. So if we have time, I'd love to hear more about that. And then um, we are also honored to be joined today by a close colleague of Dr. Maya, Thomas West, who was named by President Obama as a presidential scholar in the arts in 2014. Uh, he has also a very distinguished career as a creative artist, a social entrepreneur, and he has made uh, waves in his dual career roles, both as an artist, but also as the founding executive director of the Peace Studio, a nonprofit that equips artists and journalists with opportunities and strength-based tools to restore hope, challenge injustice, and bridge divides. Uh, one point of his bio that will be of great interest to our audience today is that as a young person, he uh, was part of a philanthropic initiative in Chattanooga, maybe we'll have some time to talk about it, where he was able to raise uh, over $16,000 as a youth philanthropist in support of arts education. He uh, schooled and trained at the Juilliard School and uh, finds time to support artists across the world um, in countries ranging from Rwanda all the way to uh, Southeast Asia and all over the United States. So this is a conversation that's much needed, how to lift up the arts and how to promote uh, artists who are working on the front lines of social change and social movement. So 
uh, the conversation uh, needs to kick off as soon as possible. So I'm going to launch right into our very first question. We'll start with Dr. Maya. Dr. Maya, thank you for joining us today. We are so looking forward to this discussion. I've had the pleasure of already hearing some uh, about your work and uh, particularly your work in building a generation of uh, peacemakers, artists and media um, artists who inspire people every day to roll up their sleeves and to work towards a more just world. The Peace Studio is remarkable and all the other work you've been able to do in this time period uh, is also inspiring. So tell us about your journey. You grew up in Hawaii and also in Indonesia, and you have experienced the diversity of the Asia Pacific region, um, the emphasis in Indonesia in particular on diversity and unity at the same time. How has this had an impact on your work at the Peace Studio? Thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure and thank you for that question. Yes, I spent uh, formative years in Indonesia, um, most of my childhood, and I was so fortunate to have a really multicultural upbringing, uh, spending time uh, in other parts of Asia, as well as Hawaii, as you mentioned. And um, all of those spaces, especially Indonesia, though, influenced my commitment to peace and conflict resolution, both because of Indonesia's positive attributes, like it's syncretic and blended and hybrid culture, um, which allowed for complexity and shared space and negotiation, and its negative qualities like violence against certain ethnic groups like um, and, and religions, like the anti-Chinese riots that I experienced in um, the early and mid 70s. Um, and it was interesting to see my neighbors who were so kind to me, who would give me sugar cane, who would um, chat with my mother as we walked um, to the corner store, throw um, rocks into the windows of that same store because that store was Chinese owned. And so what I became aware of as a very young person, I think, is this idea that we contain both. Well, we contain multitudes, right? But what I mean by bothness is this notion that individuals can be destructive and creative, selfish and magnanimous, solitary and collective. And so we, we must understand those shades of gray, our shadow selves and, and build up with authenticity, I think, a capacity to choose our higher and most compassionate self. And philanthropy has a, an important role in that. And um, provided it is philanthropy that you know, welcomes and understands and creates an environment that is ripe for, I think, learning and, and collective action and true respect. And um, I think that uh, in terms of my work with, with Peace Studio, you know, we strive so much to highlight all of human existence through the arts to understand human trauma and forgiveness and generosity and cruelty and um, cowardice and courage. And, and so as part of becoming our higher selves, we have to illuminate, I think, some of those uh, powerful stories of being human and show people and motivate them uh, to grasp for um, those, those better angels of, of nature, so to speak. I, I can go on. Um, oh, I, I was actually going to say that is amazing <laughs> uh, that you've been able to weave so much of your life story into your work and such a powerful um, set of experiences that you can draw on um, in your day-to-day -day work. I, it's just, I think, a message, I think, for all of us on the Zoom webinar today is just how we can take that draw on our experiences and help to build that more just world. So I'm going to turn it over to one of our students, uh, Shavant. He will um, introduce himself, provide a bit of background um, to his work and also his experiences here at the Lilly Family School, and then um, go into the first question. Beautiful. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Siobhan Shrestha. I'm currently in the final semester of my 
Philanthropic Studies Master's Program here at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And um, it's, it's wonderful to have both of you here today. Uh, Mr. Thomas West, as we look at the small concrete steps we can take individually and collectively to pursue justice, protect human rights, and help others going through oppression, hardships, and other adversities. As an artist, I feel that many want to focus their art around peace building today. Um, we know that philanthropy is giving of your time, talents, and treasures. However, we also know that philanthropy is giving of your testimony. Can you tell us how the Peace Studio equips artists and journalists with opportunities and strength-based tools to restore hope, challenge injustice, and bridge divides? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for that question, Shavant. It's um, so great to be here. Um, you know, I think, I, I personally believe that philanthropy is about building a better world. And I think storytelling is a huge part of that. Um, in terms of the, you know, in terms of storytelling in itself, I, you know, I think about stories as um, an opportunity to lift up worlds that don't yet exist and to ask the question, what if? Um, you know, to uh, stories can help inspire action um, and and help people connect across differences um, when nothing else is working. Um, and so, in terms of the work at Peace Studio, you know, our founding was really around this question of of how can we make peace more urgent um, and action and actionable um, and relevant to the public conversation. And how can we do it through the work of artists and storytellers? Um, peace is often perceived in relation to the 1960s peace movement of ceremony and symbol, or something that the United Nations does, or um, you know, something that uh, you know something that seems you know in the far distant future. Um, but, but we really think about you know peace building in terms of. Uh, you know, how we care for our communities, um, you know, something that is continually being built, uh, caring for sick neighbors, um, exercising your right to vote, volunteering, um, engaging in active listening, like these are all, all forms of peace building, um, of positive peace building as, as Maya would, would say. Um, and so in terms of our strategy around, you know, creating these opportunities and strengths-based tools for artists and journalists, um, you know, we really feel that uh, in order to successfully shift our country and our world from a culture that's rooted in fear and isolation um, into one that is more hopeful and more just um, and, and rooted in connection, uh, that we, you know, we need to create these opportunities for artists and, and for storytellers, um, you know, to uh, to reflect within themselves on, um, on how they want to go about building a better world, um, to uh, engage in, in, in a process of narrative storytelling that's focused on strengths um, instead of on our, instead of deficits. Um, so thinking about, uh, and you know, this is really rooted in sort of the positive psychology movement um, you know, that often, often talks about when you tell a story with, with more positive energy uh, imagery or, or hope or resilience that the result will be more positive action, um, a more hopeful and connected populace. And, um, and that's really sort of in the DNA of the, the work that we're trying to do. Um, you know, we're looking for ways to help get uh, these, these positive strengths-based stories out into the world. Um, you know, the incentives are not always there for larger media companies uh, to do this. And so, Peace Studio has a has a tremendous opportunity to to ensure that the artists and journalists that we're working with get their stories you know heard and told um, and and you know there's there's statistics that say that when a positive story is um, you know is put out into the world that it's ten times more likely to be shared on social media you know so we know that this is um, we know that this works we know that it's important um, and we also know that we're facing a media environment right now that. 83% um, of Americans believe uh, to be part of the reason we're experiencing so much hateful rhetoric and divisiveness in our country right now. Um, so we know that we need to find 
uh, we need to work um, towards a solution. We need to work towards towards change and actually you know, uh, changing the system. Um, and so and so that's yeah that's really why P Studio was created was to um, to rethink how we both train artists and journalists in terms of um, you know the way that they tell a story, but also as we build more and more um, roots in this country and in the world, um, the more people that work with us, we're hopeful that um, you know that this the system will will change and that uh, stories of hope and resilience will become the norm. Fantastic. Um, thank you for providing all of that uh, very important background to the day to day work. And we all have um, such a hopeful picture. I think just listening to you, I am um, leaning into this moment. Um, so this is a very important time, I think, to bring back Dr. Maya into the conversation and specifically ask how this uh, current, as we keep hearing, it's not a moment, it's a movement. Um, the combination of a global pandemic and economic crisis, a once in a, a lifetime really economic crisis, as well as a national reckoning on race and maybe in some ways a global movement around racial and social justice. Uh, Dr. Maya, you've often spoken about the value of serving others, but the strength that is embedded within people and communities, how we can elevate that uh, strength. So I wanted to ask, what are you seeing in the communities around the world? Because you are now engaged with artists, media makers, journalists, and young leaders um, that you have met in your work in so many different countries in the Asia Pacific region, but all over pretty much. What are you seeing about resilience, about the strength-based uh, uh, communities uh, and their ability to innovate and find solutions. Maybe you can share a few of those uh, stories with us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And, and thank you, Thomas, for bringing us to um, the point where we're paying attention to strengths. I think that strength-based approach is critical for resilience. Um, and although I spoke earlier about our shadow selves and the bothness of humans, um, I really do find human beings incredibly um, innovative and creative. And right now, this moment, as terrible and challenging as it has been, um, and some have suffered more than others, of course, um, has also revealed enormous potential. Um, around the world, of course, we see that COVID has exacerbated inequities. Um, I think, for instance, about women and how their job security is more vulnerable and they have greater challenges um, and they end up being um, caretakers and childcare falls disproportionately on their shoulders. And there's been an increase in gender-based violence, for instance. But you also see, on the flip side, incredible women's leadership. Um, and so when we kind of recognize um, the needs and we develop the courage, lean into our discomfort and begin to cast our net widely and embrace all of those strengths, which is happening, we encounter remarkable um, uh, opportunities for community source solutions. Uh, we have here in Hawaii, for instance, the Hawaii State um, Commission on the Status of Women released a feminist post-pandemic economic recovery plan um, that's entitled Building Bridges, Not Walking on Backs. And um, we see this through the Peace Studio in the many um, expressions of commitment and opportunity uh, in our artists' worlds. Uh, there are so many proven models of conflict resolution, conflict transformation and restorative justice. And that's important at a time when our country and our world is in need of healing um, right now. But we at Peace Studio, as Thomas mentioned, we focus sort of on positive peace, which is not um, just about um, healing um, the hurts of the past, but it's also about building the beloved community of the future. 
and everyone has a role to play. And at this time, we see there are so many mechanisms. We can blog and blog and podcast and journal, social media. There are so many ways that we can reach one another. Our work has been um, amplified and, and, and shared at such distances because of um, technology and our increased agility with it. And so we've been responsive in ways that we thought impossible before. And that should give us courage. You know, we need to work to consider the ways that we can proactively create environments of greater equity um, and shared space for justice and, you know, nonviolent communication to make the conflicts of the future less likely and to work before the conflict happens. And we really believe that artists can do that. Artists can build social cohesion, uh, which I think is at the core of resilience. When we feel that others have our back, when we feel others surround us, um, as we face all sorts of crises, racial and economic and climate and other crises, then we are able to um, take courage and, and persist and keep doing um, the work that we need to do. Um, there's, there's this sense that, um, you know, sort of this, uh, the, the work has to be not just about building um, peace within, which artists can help us with, but peace in action. It's, it's that positive peace of presence of understanding deep relationships, educational systems that are just, um, carceral systems that are just, it's about building peace between and for the community, those attitudes and institutions and structures that generate cooperation. And we believe that artists can motivate that, can help to initiate movements that are local and then ultimately global. And we believe that the way that we think about peace is outdated and in need of rebranding and storytellers can help us to rebrand. Philanthropists can help us to rebrand, right? Peace is still too often seen as something ceremonial or symbolic or, you know, strictly tied to security as Thomas mentioned. But, you know, the idea is that each of us can do things in our schools, our communities, our families, our religious, our community spaces to equip stakeholders at every um, scale, you know, of every age with the tools that they need to meet crisis with that sense of resilience. So I would love for everyone on the call today to consider, you know, your peace building um, identity. A, a, a big part of that is just sort of thinking about, all right, you know, how can I, you know, build, you know, circular economies? How can I use my voice, tell a, a story that hasn't been told, but you know, bring stories from shadows to light, bring stories from periphery to center. How can I support others? How can I um, perhaps um, uh, uplift or, or, or champion um, innovation? How can I bring um, the past um, and all the lessons that we have learned and, and reckon with it um, in order to nourish a future's you know, perspective that is truly imaginative with our young people. We see that schooling, for instance, for those who are educators or parents needs to come out beyond the four walls of a classroom. We have to also really reckon at this time with the fact that we are global citizens. We are impacting each other um, at great distances. And let's make sure that we learn, you know, stories that um, are diverse, um, that are um, perhaps um, the stories um, of those distant others with whom we don't feel we have anything in common. And then let's take stories in, in, in our personal lives and in our educational spaces, um, maybe of people who are even in a place of conflict with us and, and let's try to rewrite um, stories of our own in from their vantage point, wash the eyes, so to speak, and try to you know look at the past and present uh, from multiple perspectives. This is the time, um, I think, for us all to wash our eyes and reframe, reconsider um, policing, reconsider who we are, you know, what our responsibilities to one another are, and also our you know enormous potential for. Uh, contributing to community as upstanders. 
Excellent. So there's so much to take away there, but it, I just want to recap and say that each of us can be part of building peace. This is not something that just happens if all of us aren't committed and there's the part that you can do uh, within yourself, but then there's your role in building a more peaceful community and a more peaceful world. And I know there's a pledge uh, you can take uh, to be a peacemaker that I have seen on the Peace Studio website. So I know that if anyone's interested in, in learning more about that, you can certainly find that on the Peace Studio website. I'm going to pass the mic, as we say, uh, over to Portia Johnson, one of our uh, esteemed students here at the Lilly Family School, and she's going to ask the next question. So over to you, Portia. Hi, thank you everyone for having me. My name is Portia Johnson and I am a bachelor of students at the IU Lilly Family School of Philanthropy who will be graduating in May as well. Um, Dr. Maya, many students have read Br President Barack Obama's best-selling memoir, A Promised Land. In this memoir, we learn about values and leadership lessons that shape your childhood in Indonesia, Hawaii and that you have drawn on as life has taken both of you to community organizing in many corners of the globe. It's wonderful to hear about how your family was brought up with strong values surrounding responsibility, generosity, and to recognize diversity as a strength. My question would be, I would love to hear about the commitment to service and generosity that your mother, Dr. Ann, Dunham and grandmother, Madeline Dunham, nurtured in both of you and President Barack Obama. Both were trailblazers. Your grandmother rose to become vice president at the Bank of Hawaii and your mother helping pioneer microfinance programs in Asia. Can you reflect on how you gain knowledge around generosity to show compassion towards others? Thank you so much for that question and for being here today and, and part of um, the family of folks who are doing things to make the world better. Yes, thank you. Um, our mother raised us uh, in ways that I think have been instrumental uh, to the work that we've done as adults and the people we've become. Uh, she homeschooled me until middle school and uh, also homeschooled my brother through uh, several years of his childhood. And we would go and look under rocks to find bugs. We would uh, look at through telescopes up at the stars. We'd catch tadpoles, watch them and release them, spend hours looking at the moon. So in addition to connecting with the natural world, which helped to shape my environmental commitments, uh, she really did um, help us to understand that you know learning does not take place in, inside um, a classroom exclusively, but uh, it wasn't just through those meandering hours in nature that we learned that. She would take me and after homeschooling me, we would go to villages where she was a pioneer in microfinance, helping mostly women in rural Asian communities to develop uh, cottage industries, basket weaving, tile making, batik making. And she helped them to create these small businesses and to support their families, educate children and build a greater sense of autonomy in their communities. And I would accompany her while she would visit and she would listen uh, and learn. And um, a big part of her advocacy for them involved careful learning, not just um, careful listening, I mean, you know, not just listening to respond, but really listening to understand that deep listening, that listening between words um, that is so much a part of uh, collaborative endeavor and as the kind of listening that will help build true connection between individuals and communities. You know, so everywhere she went, she sort of felt that she had family. 
And uh, she had so much respect for the multiple cultures and communities. She did an excellent job of building bridges and encouraging us to walk across them so that we felt really flexible by the time we were adults. You know, everywhere could be home if we had enough respect, um, if we listened hard enough and every people could be family. Um, so often during my first years as an educator, I would look to my mother's community work to find inspiration for my own. And I know my brother did as well as a community organizer. And it was always about building those bridges between um, all the spaces of family and community and, and, and school. And um, I think that when um, mom died, she, she said, I, I wanted always initially to be buried um, before she died, she said this, I wanted um, always to be buried under a beautiful tree atop a hill where you could come and read poetry to me and share stories of your children. But I've changed my mind and I think you need to um, scatter my ashes in the water because she said, how else am I going to get to all of the beautiful people and places I've loved so much in life? And so, you know, I think that that was sort of a testament, you know, that in, even in death, she wanted to make sure that she could be a sojourner and that we could, you know, that was a spirit that we could all cultivate. Now, that doesn't mean that you aren't rooted and committed to community and to culture around you. You know, we have uh, to remember from whence we came. We have to remember our elders. We have to remember uh, the, the beautiful cultures that helped to shape us and the traditions. Um, but we also have to um, use them in, in for new purpose and to reveal the peace work that they have to do in the future. And a big part of that is I think always going to be um, that connection, that traveling. And um, our grandmother was a very different kind of woman. <laughs> She was um, a banker, really sensible, and gave us our pragmatic selves. Um, she was the one, though, that helped us to be brave about being um, educators or community organizers and not worrying and not making decisions about money. So as philanthropists, you will help to play that role. People will live out their life's purpose. They will. Um, feel more courageous about being, you know, the, ad, the activists, the, the advocates, the, um, the, the doers and the builders that they need to be if they know that they have people like you who are helping um, and functioning as a net to catch them um, and, and, you know, offering um, support. And, you know, it takes so much courage to do um, you know, the, the work of community building. And, and we have to redefine courage, not just as taking that one big leap out of a plane, but courage is about going down that long road when you don't know where exactly you're going to um, be able to rest. You don't know where you're gonna get your next meal. Uh, you're tired, you're thirsty, um, but you keep going. And, uh, and you have to trust that people like all of you who are on this call today are there um, beside you um, and, 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 and behind you, um, helping you uh, to find the courage uh, to keep walking. And that's what our grandmother offered us, I think. Um, she was very sensible, um, you know, Kansas, Midwestern, no nonsense, born of the um, depression very frugal. And um, between the two of these women, we, um, we had um, you know, two incredible and very different champions um, helping us to be uh, both powerfully adventurous and to feel safe. I'm so glad that uh, Portia brought up that important question because it's also a chance to wish you, Dr. Maya, a happy International Women's Day and Women's Month. And it's also wonderful to celebrate the great uh, inspiring women in your life and, and for sharing those important stories because I think we're all equipped with 
more courage and more adventure now and willingness to take on risks. So thank you. Um, I did want to uh, turn it over to the, the discussion about philanthropy is so timely. I wanted to bring uh, Thomas and then also you, Dr. Maya, to reflect. This is a moment where the art sector has been particularly challenged. So artists of all kinds um, have found it more um, challenging to reach their audiences, to uh, raise funds, but also to engage because typically when we think about whether it's performing arts or even studio, it does involve a fair amount of in-person. So I wanted to ask uh, Thomas first to uh, share with us what he has seen in terms of how the art sector is pivoting perhaps, uh, artists themselves are learning new ways of engaging with their audiences and what all of us can do to support artists in our own communities during this time. Uh, so Thomas, you'll start, but we'll bring it back to Dr. Maya. Absolutely, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, we'll certainly, um, you know, we have seen so much innovation uh, from artists during this time, but it's also been, you know, we can't, uh, you know, we have to acknowledge that it's, it's been, it's been challenging that there's certain experiences when you're in a room with someone that you can't really fully recreate, you know, through digital means, um, the feeling of, uh, you know, hearing a, a pin drop or, um, you know, experiencing, uh, you know, seeing someone, someone breathe, um, you know, just this sort of our common humanity that, that I think comes across you know, most effectively in a shared space um, in person. Um, so I'm eager for us to get back to that. Um, but artists are, you know, artists and, and all kinds of storytellers are, are naturally innovative. And, um, you know, in terms of our work at the Peace Studio uh, over the past year, we, we launched a, a global campaign called 100 Offerings of Peace that reached 1.2 million worldwide. And the idea was we, we asked the question, you know, how can, how can artists contribute to, um, you know, making peace still feel urgent and relevant to people in this moment where we're not together. And, and so we asked artists to, to respond to a prompt, which was what, you know, what does peace mean to them in this moment during this pandemic when we are isolated and we are in our own spaces, you know, what, how are they practicing it? How are they experiencing it? And what, what kind of story could they tell that would embody that? And, and so we had, um, you know, hundreds of artists apply and, and ended up selecting a hundred to, uh, you know, where we commissioned them to create these, these, what we call peace offerings, these works of art around, around peace building at this moment. And, uh, and we released one a day and each of the artists um, also added a, an action step to the offerings so that there was a, a direct entry point for an audience to say, you know, this, this story about loss or this this story about um you know racial justice or whatever whatever the case was you know it um you know what can i do as an audience member now that i've experienced this and the artist recommended an action step um you know a way to speak up a way to way to contribute um and it really speaks to the the concept that that maya has instilled in all of us at the peace studio from the very beginning that that we can't wait for top-down governmental solutions to build peace. We have to, it, it begins with each one of us, it begins through these, these small steps. Um, so I, I really am, I'm hopeful by and inspired by the, you know, by artists around the world that are finding ways to be, to be innovative, the, the TikTokers and the, um, you know, the people that are able to just create, you know, incredible content with their, their iPhone camera and, um, and we need them, we need them more than ever. And I think, um, in terms of the second part of your question around, you know, what can, what can we do? I think seeking out um, content that is restorative and strengths-based and, and sharing it, um, you know, committing, committing yourself to that. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, believing that, uh, that, that arts and storytelling are such a fundamental part of, of the work of building a society, you know, that's, that's sort of my life's mantra is to make sure that artists and storytellers are always at the table because I think that, um, you know, they are, they're critical and, and have been for, for ages to, 
uh, to shaping our culture and in giving us hope in a way that that no other uh, group of people can. Um, and so the more that we we spread that, I think uh, the better off we'll be. I love that. I, I should say that uh, I am an economist, so trained and steeped in data, but I'm learning that you have to pair data with storytelling and to really drive change. We need both. We need our, our data scientists, but we also need our storytellers who can help us weave uh, those uh, data points into a very powerful tapestry. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now just ask each of you to perhaps uh, give us a little bit of a call to action. So you both have these very distinct leadership roles at the Peace Studio. Dr. Meyer, you're also uh, sitting on the Obama Foundation's uh, International uh, Global Advisory Board. So you have a global vision of leadership, of understanding of how we can help support um, leaders and social movements. You've worked within grassroots organizations as well as the grass talks, and you're helping individuals navigate their own vision through the arts. Um, the question that I have is how can all of us find our voices? This is something especially I hear a lot with young people. And what advice do you have to young leaders who want to have a global impact? How can all of us support uh, those who are working on the front lines of social justice, of uh, sharing stories? What is the um, message that you have today for all of our audiences, whether they're students just starting out on their journey who want to have a global impact or leaders who are well-established in their own domains, but also want to connect uh, the dots and have a greater impact. So leadership lessons, what advice would you give for, for leaders around the world today? Shall I start? Oh, okay. I, um, thank you. Well, I would love for every one of your students and everyone on the call to, I would love for you to think of yourselves as peace building uh, leaders. I, I'm wondering if I, we can create like a new idea of uh, philanthropy, like um, sort of navigational philanthropists. <laughs> Um, because I really believe in uh, leadership um, uh, that is um, navigational. And this is, of course, a very natural thing in Hawaii, um, where we uh, are surrounded by water. But this notion that uh, we have uh, beautiful island destinations, we have to, through um, navigational leadership, recognize that we are on a boat together um, and that even though there are some who are skilled navigators, there are many roles and we have to read the elements. We have to encourage and protect our environment. We need each person to bring their instincts, intuition, knowledge, wisdom, experiences to bear in nuanced ways. We need to lead um, with our heart and intuition too. And it's funny, leading with um, our heart may seem corny to some, but it's actually quite challenging um, to do sometimes in a world of conflict. It requires courage, it requires that we be vulnerable and empathetic. Um, and I think that uh, we have to think about uh, the wisdom offered up by by local and root and indigenous cultures, but also have a futurist perspective, as I mentioned, uh, that enables us to lift one another up with a sense of possibility and and uh, and, and a growth in, in the sense of shared endeavor, uh, collective problem solving towards uh, Share, you know, common common purpose, more collective approaches, perhaps, as opposed to single charismatic leadership. Leadership, I think, uh, we have seen that is all about the individual engaging in self promotion is is ultimately um, quite damaging and, and potentially dangerous. And as given the injustice and equality and, and challenges of our time, the houselessness, displacement, food insecurity, conflict, um, violence, we're the center of so many storms. And whether you're working with 
community organizations or government or uh, academic institutions, I think um, you all need to think about how to remain standing and resilient in those storms, but also how to help others and uh, on a global level even, you know, um, but certainly in terms of your work, how to be serious about caring for one another and cultivating an environment of a generosity and, and awareness about the other. Having um, passion and, and creative ideas for implementation is exciting. You think about all of the people who have no problem sharing their voice, the trolls, the conspiracy theorists who are down in some basement, you know, doing um, you know, th things to doctor photographs and, and um, you all need to be really brave about sharing your stories. Feel affirmed that you have something to give, something to share. Do it with joy and a sense of interbeing, you know, and, and a, a real happiness in becoming and creating together, making the difficult done and the improbable possible, I like to say. And so I think that, you know, the guiding principles, of course, have to be, you know, make sure that you are raising your voice and asking yourself, you know, am I making sure I'm, am I be doing my, my best to be reflective? Um, am I really privileging community ownership of this process? Am I being inclusive? Am I being process oriented? Am I hearing all voices? Am I welcoming um, people who have not been at the table or in the room? Am I having fun and being calm and building trust and creating safe spaces and being mindful and supportive? So I think it's good to have reflective practices around um, sharing your voice and helping others to do so, but we all have to act and we have to act now and engage in this sort of, in, in this healing work. And, and all of us are artists and storytellers. I have no eye hand coordination. I have no singing voice. I have, um, you know, no, um, clear artistic skill, but when you see the hundred offerings of peace, we recognize that people can be artists from from a pulpit or uh, a classroom or a prison. And so all of us must think of ourselves as artist storytellers, right? And and support others and be in being a bridge, not just the inner world of individuals, but the dynamic landscape between people, families, communities, and nations. The arts can weave together this collective narrative, we say at the Peace Studio, that can bear witness to suffering, loss, conflict, and discrimination, yes, but as you know, um, Thomas mentioned earlier, can also transform, help us to highlight our strengths and help us to be deeply heard and have our communities and cultures heard and our young people and build that sense of safety and reparation and reconciliation. Yes, but with you know justice, if you can infuse trauma with new light and transcend suffering and, and come to a place of wholeness and health. So I would love for each of you to really think about how you can, you know, reflect and, and transform your space, your identity, your work, wherever that is, into peace building work and, and um, uh, the artist's work with a moral imagination. Excellent. Um, so I, I have a lot of homework to do, but I think one thing that I really um, resonate with is the notion of reflective leadership. and to ensure that your own, you're using your voice, but you're doing so in a way that builds peace, that's inclusive, and that builds a sense of community and justice. So Thomas, you also have a call to action for all of us. So I'm going to give you the Zoom uh, room, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to uh, share your own reflections from all of the uh, spaces you've occupied around the mm -hmm. world. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I just have um, you know one quick thought to sort of build on what Maya was saying, which is that I really feel like we're living in a moment where individuals are the ones driving change, and um, you know institutions of, of course are still important, but I think 
Um, I think, you know, obviously I think about Greta Thunberg as, as you know, a prominent example, but there's so many others um, that people that, you know, we've worked with at the Peace Studio, like uh, Jasmine Babers, who um, founded this, the, the Love Girls magazine, um, you know, in response to rampant cyberbullying in her high school, or Scarlett Lewis, who spoke at one of the first um, Peace Studio summits in 2017, who's son Jesse was um, killed at the at Sandy Hook Elementary when he stood in front of all the other children and told them to run and she's now founded a, a movement um, a choose love movement and works with with parents of um, of both victims and of uh, perpetrators or of, of people um, and so you know I think you know I, I often get asked the question when I'm speaking with grant makers or I'm speaking with philanthropists um, about the peace studio, I get, I get asked, well, you know, you have this dream for a, a media making peace movement. Um, you have this, this vision for investing in these strengths-based narratives, but how is that really going to, you know, systemically change the culture that where there are these, you know, incentive structures that are making it so impossible for a journalist to get their story um, you know, broadcast or heard because um, it doesn't, it's not going to get as many clicks or likes or views. It's not, it's not um, rooted in something that would, that would, you know, capture or, or make us fearful or, you know, capture someone's attention in a split second. Um, and, you know, my response is always that I feel like um, we have to kind of rethink about how we're making impact, you know, that we have to think about um, impact not just in terms of of metrics at all times, or just in terms of you know, uh, you know, um, how many views something a piece of content is getting. We have to think about how we're impacting people individually. Um, we have to think about uh, trying to build movements. Um, you know, I think about the nonprofit Color of Change and the work that they're doing. You think about how they, uh, you know, they're making such tremendous impact through people power. And um, I think similarly with the work that Peace Studio is trying to do, we're, you know, when we, when we create fellowships for artists or journalists to, to work on strengths-based narratives, I think there's value there. I think that there's something to be said for giving them that opportunity and space to, um, to reframe how they tell stories, because the more that we do that, the more you know, creatives will be out in the world that will, that will demand that we change the way we, the, you know, the way we talk in our current media environment and it will help us break out of these eco chambers that we're living in currently. Um, so to Maya's point about, you know, being confident in your stories and being willing to, um, you know, being willing to stand up for what you think uh, matters, I, I think this is the moment to do it of, of all moments, um, especially as we head into the UN decade of action and um, there's so much to be done um, urgently, um, and if we can do it together and, and collaborate, one of my board members often says collaboration is her favorite word, and I, I really agree with that. I think it's also a moment to collaborate. Um, so I, you know, I just encourage, um, you know, everyone at, uh, you know, at the, the Lily School to just be thinking about what, you know, what you can do, what you can contribute, because um, this is the moment for individuals to rise up and, and lead. Well, very well said, and I just want to agree. And, uh, you know, virtually, I think if we could do a, you know, high five, uh, sending that to you, uh, certainly we see that in our data. Individuals make up the lion's share of American philanthropy. Uh, your, your point about impact is also something that I think we all are grappling with, that impact is not just about the metrics. How do we bring uh, the lives that are changed. A, a child listens to a musical performance or participates in a theater a workshop. Those can be life-changing and it's very hard to put numbers around that. I'm going to ask our students uh, just very quickly, Portia and Siobhan, if they have, the, we've all heard so much today. We've been enriched by this conversation. Um, I just wondered if they had uh, one or two quick follow-up questions. Our audience are starting to send in, uh, several of our audience members are sending in questions. Please send them through the Q&A function. Uh, but I wanted to give Siobhan and Portia one opportunity to chime in and uh, ask any follow-up questions that they may have. 
Yes, I can start. Thank you so much for all of these gems, first of all, uh, Dr. Maya and Thomas. Um, you guys' stories relate so parallel to mine. And um, as a philanthropist and being in capstone class this semester is so dynamic that you guys mentioned sharing storytelling. And I'm also a Nina Mason Polium Legacy Scholar an ambassador, and that's just an organization that represents underrepresented, um, underrepresented scholars who have come from very, many, very uh, various backgrounds, excuse me, and um, just with dependents or with disabilities or even foster youth. And some of the things that I have learned through my philanthropic autobiography are that, you know, I was once actually a homeless student and I have two children and I heard Dr. Maya talk about homeschooling, which I'm on the verge of doing that as well. So there's so many elements and I'm just so excited, you know, just to converse and hear more about peace. But um, I know you talked about like looking under rocks and finances with your grandmother and different things like that. What advice can you give non-traditional students who have unique backgrounds to just kind of continue engaging other students and facilitating that work to just bring about different changes? Thank you, Portia. You're wonderful. I'm so glad that you're doing philanthropic autobiographies. Um, the advice that I would give is just know your value. Um, in, in every space. When I was teaching on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the mid 90s, my students had subway passes that would take them to every um, borough, but they never left their 10 block radius. And they, they told me um, that they didn't really know why, but I really suspect that it was because they didn't feel like they would be welcomed perhaps outside of their communities or that they had perhaps, you know, enough of a value to share or, you know, there were these invisible barriers somehow that, that they felt. Um, and it made me sad. So if I saw a big part of my work as getting them to move beyond. So on Saturdays, we, that school had a, um, a museum program, we'd take them to the Museo del Barrio and the uh, Isamu no Gucci Museum uh, and the New York Historical Society and, and that sort of thing. But I think that um, I recognized as part of the great bounty of my childhood was the sense that, you know, our mom gave us that you belong everywhere, right? Again, as long as you are listening as long as you are respectful and compassionate and kind. And what I would say to non-traditional students are you belong and you have enormous um, gifts to give and you can help others to see things that they had not seen that will make their lives uh, better, that will make communities stronger, that will help uh, increase um, justice, that will lessen the distance between uh, souls that will make philanthropy more impactful, that will allow you all collectively to adapt your methods for um, the purposes and the needs of today, um, that you will bring uh, as a non-traditional student, greater common sense uh, and uh, creativity because you've had to live that way. You will bring greater passion because you've had to use that to protect those you love um, because you've had to survive. You will be stronger and you will convey that. You will share that in ways that will be valuable to all who have the good sense and courage to listen. You know, you will bring, you know, um, a certain practical practice, and you will ensure, I believe, that um, the, the work that you are doing together benefits a larger cross-section of the community. And indeed, that is what we all need. 
um, because what is good for um, you know more is is better for me. We realize that, and we also know today that we should not be doing things you know nothing um, for us without us. We need greater diversity of voice of representation and and non-traditional students represent a wider cross-section of um, our beloved community that needs desperately to be heard and um, those strengths to be used that they, that they bear and carry. I have one follow-up question. I hear you talk about strengths a lot and through the program, the Nina Mason Pullian Scholarship, we have delved into strength quests. I was curious, have you ever did that particular assessment? And if so, do you happen to know your top five strengths in that assessment? I haven't, but I'd love to try it. I mean, yeah, send it my way. Um, did, okay. you, did you find it <laughs> valuable? It, was it a valuable exercise? Should it was try? absolutely invaluable because they do like holistic approaches. And so my top five are maximizer, achiever, um, wait, maximizer, achiever, significant communication, and woo. So there is really dynamic and I'll like to hear that. Thank, thank you so much, Portia. I am uh, also very conscious of we have some questions coming in and I know Siobhan's, if you have one last question and um, then if we have time, we'll circle back, but thank you so much. And Portia, especially, thank you for sharing your strengths. I think I love the strengths-based approach and I'm, I'm so um, really excited to hear about uh, the work that you are doing and um, very, very pleased that you're able to be part of this conversation. Siobhan, um, I don't know if you wanted to uh, chime in with any questions. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Portia, for that question. It was very interesting. And thank you again, Dr. Mayan Thomas, for your um, inspiring stories and perspectives today. Building around the conversation on the work you do with artists, journalists, I would love to hear your insights and advice on fostering an intersection between peace building and climate justice and the roles artists and journalists have in effectively telling an, a story that is equitable and multicultural and, and international around climate justice and action. Oh my gosh, that is such a big question. And I, I know that we don't have a lot of time. I can speak quite a, a bit to that, but I think for now, I will just say that our approach needs uh, to work right now um, at the intersection of, um, of climate and, and peace and justice, because um, there are many who have been doing climate um, work um, that are just using that data that Dr. Una mentioned and not weaving in stories. And it has created a um, uh, sort of a, a, a framework that is uh, of, of activism that is often lacking in compassion. Um, as an example, my Institute for Climate and Peace partner, Maxine, when she was with um, others in the room where decisions were made and policies shaped, uh, heard a very prominent colleague speak about uh, islands and sort of very uh, nonchalantly say that, well, there were some islands that were just going to be going underwater and that's just the way of things. This notion of sacrifice zones and expendable areas is, is still all too common and her mouth was the only one that was agape in astonishment. You know, there was a sort of nod of like, yeah, we have to accept these pragmatic outcomes. But of course there are people inhabiting those islands for whom this is not an acceptable uh, uh, um, sacrifice. So I think that um, we really need to be looking at those frontline communities. Now, the good news is that those are the communities that have a great many solutions about how to be resilient and how to prepare for disaster, how to um, do community mapping, how to communicate 
um, more uh, effectively so that uh, there is resilience, how to build sustainable systems through fish ponds or, you know, taro patches and farms, how to uh, cooperate effectively um, uh, for relief and, and uh, to help one another um, if disaster cannot be prevented. Um, you know, so these kinds of uh, communities, once we um, really acknowledge and respect, make sure that they are fully represented, offer a, a great many solutions that are valuable for all of us that we can then transpose, adapt to our own situations and settings in order to increase resilience. So, um, but uh, philanthropy um, in the climate space is urgently needed right now. Um, we are, you know, back in Paris, we, we are working on climate policy, but again, a lot of the solutions um, around climate are happening, whether it's um, in terms of adaptation or mitigation, um, they are happening from communities and uh, those solutions need to be supported. Uh, so uh, please do um, make sure that there is robust uh, support for that. So we have a few questions that have come in and I want to make sure that we provide an opportunity for both of you to respond. One question has to do with how you are integrating the work of the Peace Studio with say the State Department or some of the other government initiatives. And another question is what you see as the impediments or barriers to peace building around the world. Are there some country level barriers that you've identified or even perhaps institutional barriers? So maybe we'll start with you, Thomas, and then come back to Dr. Maya. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for both of those, those great questions. Um, you know, we haven't uh, yet explored, um, you know, partnership with, with government and institutions at the Peace Studio, um, but something that we are preliminary, you know, exploring and looking into, I think, again, with the, what I spoke to earlier about collaboration, I think um, that theme rings true that um, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, especially with the new administration of, of, you know, the possibilities around, um, you know, a, around, I think, a greater emphasis on culture and on, um, and on storytelling and arts, because I think, you know, those are the things that will contribute to a more, um, you know, just and humane society. Um, and I also, you know, I think in, inherent in that question too is, is um, you know, that we've seen over the past uh, five years um, and even more in the, the past year, you know, a real emphasis on peace building efforts here in the United States. Um, I think uh, there's an urgency. I mean, a lot of times it's called more or less bridge building, but I think, I think there's an urgency right now to, um, to impact local communities and to, to use um, you know, grassroots storytelling efforts to, uh, to engage in conversations because the arts present a, a new language, if you will, um, that's, that something else might not provide. And, I, and I've seen it time and time again in local communities where a performance or a, you know, a, an exhibit or a, a conversation um, engages people in a really visceral way that, that um, you know, begins to, change their the way that they think or the you know the the actions that they take or the conversations they have with their children um and we need to be doing more and more of that uh and i think there's a i mean there's a huge opportunity um to work with with government with the you know with the u.s government with the department of state on that um and it's a shame that that our government's not more involved i think in in cultural work i mean in europe you you know if you're a working artist you're paid often by the government for your you, know, you that's where you earn your paycheck and in the states that's just not the case and uh you know that's that's a little separate from what the the pc is trying to do but it, i i feel very passionate that it you know it would be great to see that change and see more emphasis there um did you want to to add anything maya I mean, I think that's right. I think it would be wonderful if, you know, we had um, government subsidies for the arts that were really robust and widely felt. And, you know, um, um, there is some uh, support for the arts, of course, but I, I think that um, 
one of the things that uh, I want to share with um, your callers is that the um, senator from Hawaii, Mark Matsunaga, was one of four uh, Congress uh, members who um, were instrumental in creating the United States Institute of Peace. This uh, is a fully bipartisan institute located in Washington, D.C., across um, from the um, the Lincoln Memorial, I think it is a really um, important resource. It um, has a board that's 50% you know, Republican, 50% Democratic, but it works very closely uh, with the Department of State, Department of Defense, and all of these things. What they wanted to do, what Spark Matsunaga wanted to do was to create a Department of Peace, a full, you know, um, a department in the U.S. government um, to align with the Department of Defense. That didn't come to fruition, but this institution is there and there are a great many courses um, that are offered free and a lot of resources um, in their toolkits for high school, for middle school, but also for adults. You can take um, in their academy, online academy, you can get a certificate and you learn uh, conflict resolution, negotiation, mediation, movement building and other things. Uh, so uh, I did wanna point out that resource. I'm on the um, advisory council. We have a, um, a lot of uh, hope that in the, the next few years, there will be a, a robust, work uh, in peace building um, that links with government. But I, I also think that there needs to be more governmental investment in terms of uh, peace duty. I'm, I'm particularly excited about the possibility of working with mayors, um, just looking at uh, public art spaces in at the city and county level uh, is, is extraordinary because there's greater agility at the local level for, um, for artists and storytellers to work to transform public spaces. Uh, I have seen in, you know, uh, in Detroit and here in Hawaii, even during the pandemic, um, artists who have uh, created spaces that allow for social isolation gap fillers, so to speak, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where people will you know, find um, empty spaces and, and create something there that inspires, that gives hope, that speaks also to this time and um, that um, offers momentum as we move forward out of this time um, to help people consider um, the future and to um, get excited about um, uh, the growing possibilities of tomorrow. So I, I think that there is uh, there is a lot of potential and uh, I, I hope that we can, as a Peace Studio uh, family, do do more um, in the future. Well, this has just been an, an inspiring conversation, a peaceful conversation. I have felt the warmth, the kindness, the generosity uh, from both of you. And even a little bit of the Hawaiian sunshine has come into our conversation today. Thank you both for the amazing leadership that you're providing around the world and for elevating this conversation about peace, about justice and the need to use our voices, but in a way that is respectful and compassionate and builds community. So I am inspired and really energized by this discussion. And so thanks to both of you, uh, we look forward to bringing you back to the Lilly Family School in person when conditions allow. And maybe we'll get a chance to see you in Boston or in Hawaii at some point as well. Um, in terms of just thanking everyone, I also want to thank our fantastic students, Portia and Shavant for being part of this conversation. You are both amazing. And we're just so fortunate to have you as part of this discussion. I also want to thank my colleagues, uh, LaCoya Rochelle, who helped bring this conversation to life, Amy Conley, uh, Diantha Daniels, my other colleague who helped organize, and then finally, special thanks to our sponsor, Lumina Foundation, for helping support this very important work. Um, but uh, the thanks also goes to all of you, our audience, 
who've joined us from so many different uh, parts of the country and the world. And we look forward to, as I mentioned, re-inviting you back to the Lilly Family School, hopefully sometime soon, to continue this conversation. This is just the beginning. Thank you. I love it. Thank you. You're all so wonderful. And we're so grateful for this time. Yeah, thank you so much.